This is the Ted Walshin Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortinos, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. I have been a longtime fan of comedian impressionist John Biner. During his remarkable career, he appeared regularly on the top television shows of the time, The Ellen Sullivan Show, The Tonight Show, first with Steve Allen, and then, of course, with Johnny Carson, and The Carol Burnett Show, to name but a few. He also starred on Broadway, the big screen, provided the voices of Jackie Mason and Dean Martin for the animated show The Ant and the Aardvark, hosted his own television variety show and introduced us to the amazing Super Dave Osborne. He has also co-authored Five Minutes, Mr. Biner, A Lifetime of Laughter. He did so with his colleague, Douglas Wilman. John Biner, nice to chat with you again, sir. How are you? And Ted, nice talking to you, too. I'm fine. Thank you very much, and I, I hear you better. I am better, and, and thank you for asking and, and for mentioning that. I'm your book actually came out about a year or so ago, but this whole pandemic yeah, thing you, is uh, first of this month. Yeah, it's a year, and so it's available now anywhere. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> so I, I mentioned, you know, the your comedian uh, impressions. You're a comedian. You're an actor. You're impressionist. If you could only choose one thing to describe yourself, which would it be? A father. Ah. <laughs> of, of four children that's the thing <laughs> yeah that's the thing i'm most proud of okay now moving on from there as far as the the biz goes i would say i would say uh i'm kind of a, a layback kind of guy so i would say acting because there's a lot of, okay john come back thursday <laughs> we'll do the rest of the scene yeah you know you... that's that's my kind of schedule but uh but i like i just like making people laugh i like music i like to do johnny mathis and elvis and mm-hmm. all those people and uh that joe cocker and i just i just get a kick out of uh, working with a band and and uh and doing those impersonations of of uh people i admire mm-hmm. now you, you know what i find interesting is is and and I'm, I think I'm accurate when I say your big break came on the Ed Sullivan show. And this is a guy, when I watched the Ed Sullivan show over the years, I thought this guy never had a sense of humor at all. But but apparently he had quite a good sense of humor. Oh, and and he loved you. Yeah, the best. I loved him. He was like a father figure. From a, watching him as a kid and growing, finally meeting him and then going on and all that. Uh, he was a great guy. I, I I liked him. I admired him. And he was... He was the one that sat back and scheduled the show and how it would go. And I thought he was a brilliant uh, scheduler, I guess you'd call him. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, he'd, he'd follow something that people may not be that interested in the, in the country, but followed by something, bang, a soccer thing. And then, you know, it was just, he knew how to go. He knew the rhythm. Yeah, but he, the, the way you landed on the show, unconventional to say the least. Yeah, I, I, I was working a club in, in uh, Greenwich Village. I did a lot of that. And uh, uh, the, the uh, Callan coordinator, Jack Babb, came in to uh, hear me. Someone told him I was doing an impersonation of Ed Sullivan and he wanted to hear it. And uh, he got hold of me after the show and he said, hey, you know, uh, uh, why don't you come and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll set you up in the uh, dress rehearsal Sunday, this was on a Thursday or a Wednesday or Thursday. And he said, uh, and if you, and the, if the old man likes him, that's, you know, Ed Sullivan, he referred to him as the old man. The old man likes you. We'll put you on in a couple of weeks or whatever up the road. So I said, fine. So I come in and I hadn't met him. He just introduces me and I come out and I do my thing. And I go back up to the, <laughs> I go back up to the dressing room to pack up and get ready to drive out to Long Island again and go back to my regular gig. Then knock on the door. The old man likes you and you're on tonight. <laughs> and that's the way it went. And that's the way it started. And I did 18 Sullivan shows over the years. And, and he loved when you did the impression of him. I just did. He just got a kick out of me because 
like all his help and the guys in the booth would say, God, you got into that guy's mind. <laughs> Just, mm-hmm. <laughs> because I do, well, I got to, you know, one of the cocky. So sometimes he didn't know what to say, so he'd just say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so so years years later, after doing uh, the Sullivan Show, you returned to what has now been renamed the Ed Sullivan Theater, which is the home of Late Night with David Letterman. It, it, did you experience any sort of deja vu when, when, that, when that all went down? Oh, yeah. I, I had the same dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same. Things had changed. They didn't. They didn't uh, they built a little uh, green room uh, right uh, after the back, you know, uh, the exit from the backstage. There's a green room there where all the acts and everybody that are not busy being made up, they can sit around and wait to be called. <clears throat> and they, they didn't have that before. It was just your dressing room and you knew the act you were going to follow and you showed up backstage and there you go. You mm-hmm. know? So so, uh, so that was it, and we met on the we met on the staircases and on the stairways. You know, people would talk to me while I was standing on the steps, a few steps up from going on. You know, <laughs> they say, you know, it was there was no green room, in other words, and and that was the only difference. Otherwise, you know, it's the same stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're talking yeah. to John Biner, comedian John Biner. His book is called Five Minutes, Mister Biner: A Lifetime of Laughter. Let's go back to the beginning. In your book, you talk about coming from a quote normal family no abusive father alcoholic mother or uncle who lived in the attic and played the bugle although i believe we should all have one of those uh one one a fifth of uh, of six children the, the 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 part of you coming from a normal family that, that's not part of a comedian's dna normally my dna didn't didn't come from having to you know uh I, my DNA just came from the the fifth of six kids, and uh, by the time my brother Tom and I, the younger younger than I, two years, and by the time we came along, parents were like, they've taken pictures, <laughs> so we, there aren't too many photos of us, <laughs> Tom and I. <laughs> yeah, it's true, you know, because by that time they're worn out with the kids and the this and the schools and the thing and the meetings and the thing, and. Uh, and and we just sort of like survived on our own, and we moved a lot, and in so doing. The, the the chance to make friends and bond and all that kind of stuff was out of the question. So yeah. I used the things that I I knew it, uh, pleased my family. I do that to my friends. I, I do impersonations or what have you, uh, of uh, cartoon voices that I've developed and and with the new kids in school. And and I came from a shy place is what you, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And uh, and and that so was was my drive to get attention and also show people what I could do. And also the big, the big thing in big letters, make people laugh, you know, that was it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about um, your first professional gig. Would, would that have been the Oaks nightclub in New Jersey? That was out in Long Island. I was re- born and raised in Long Island, various places from in the city of Queens and now to Long Island, as far as Bohemia, uh, not far from Sayville, if people are listening and they know what I'm talking about, and uh, <clears throat> and and my uh, my first the the uh, the the, fir- the question was what I got into fa- going back and seeing these th- pictures of my family and and uh, what was the question? Well, the, your first professional gig. This is you you enlist in, in the armed forces and you spend some time there. Uh, you've, yeah. been, you've been going to talent uh, well, contests as a young gig. kid. Well, this was, you know, this was 40 bucks under the table, but it was the Oaks Club in Long Island. All right. And I just worked uh, Friday nights and Saturday night. No, mostly Saturday nights because I had a regular job building swimming pools at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and that was just 40 bucks under the table from the boss. And, um, and my first professional gig was after... After I did the uh, Merv Griffin Talent Scout show, that was before all the other shows. Right. Before Sullivan, he had a little show that he did that was a copy of the uh, uh, thing that was done years ago, the Arthur Godfrey Talent sure, Scout show, sure, sure. where there are three uh, ho- uh, famous people that come on one at a time. And he said, well, who did you discover? And the guy pretends he mm-hmm. discovered someone in the nightclub or on the street or whatever. And, uh, and Merv Griffin uh, was, uh, his, his producer was someone who, I, uh, 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 a high school, uh, high school friend or uh, friend knew that uh, uh, 
was able to get me to, to uh, audition for the producer. And uh, in so doing, I was booked on the Merv Griffin Talent Scout show. And they, they uh, introduced someone that the, the producer and, and Merv Griffin discovered. And, uh, and after that show, I went back to the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and I drove the truck until I got a call uh, to work up in the, uh, a, little, a little nightclub in uh, Rochester, New York. Not, yeah. oh, about 300 miles from my house. Are you, you sure it was a nightclub? Oh, well, it wasn't. It was, an, a, 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 <laughs> you know what I call it. It was like a coffee house. And, uh, and to me, every place was a small stage was a nightclub. Yeah. And, uh, and this was a, a coffee house with a coffee machine that went off just about every time I'd do a punchline. Yeah. Well, no, wasn't, wasn't it <laughs> you know, originally a, a, a gas station? A gas at one station. Point? Yeah. Yes. It was a gas station. I, I, I think everybody knew that. <laughs> the book. I guess that's why I'm talking to you like this. But it was a gas station. The, the, the uh, Pumps had been removed to make room for parking and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a, it was a winter and we had a, uh, it was winter time. I worked two weeks there and they had uh, one of these salamanders. It was like an oil stove for eating. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was <laughs> making this noise. Yeah, very nice. And it was a coffee house and there, I had a good time. And, uh, and uh, I enjoyed the uh, guys that owned it. Three guys chipped in to do it, to open this thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, Chuck Mangione played trumpet between my my sets, and uh, and I didn't know his last name was Mangione. Yeah. And years later, we were listening to a radio. My manager at the time and I, and and he says that this trumpet player. He says, yeah. Yes. He says that's good. I said that. He says that's Chuck. He used to play between you. So I said Chuck Mangione was with the Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, he, he made some uh, money. Have you run into him since that? No, have not seen him, not even getting close to seeing him. There no, no, nothing in the news would say he's in town or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that was him. He's a good guy. Over, over the years, you, you performed in a lot of jazz clubs and befriended many of the top names in jazz. Tell me about some of those relationships. Well, um, I worked the Harry James band not far into uh, uh, one or two Ed Sullivan shows. Uh, who, was, who was huge I, at the time. Yeah, yeah, he was still going around playing big bands and working the Tonight shows and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, everybody loved him and uh, the, the big crowds would come out and see us. And uh, I'd come out and introduce him and then I'd come out and do something. And then, you know, we had uh, Nina Simone and uh, Buddy Rich was on the drums and I mean, it was fantastic. And I got to know all these, you know, guys that had been in the business for so long. And I was just like a kid, not knowing anything about anything. And it was quite the experience. What was Buddy Rich like? Because you hear stories of he had a bit of a temper, did he? I I did not see that. I did not see that in, in Buddy. He, 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 we'd, we'd be on the bus and someone would say, here comes Buddy. And he, would, he had uh, this beautiful car, uh, the race car type of thing. And he'd fly by us, a Jaguar, I believe it was. And he'd fly by us like, like a shot. And he'd be waiting at the next stop when we worked again, you know, in the next city, next town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he was a good guy, a lot of laughing. He liked to laugh. He, uh, he was funny. He, there's a, a recording out of him uh, chastising the guys. <laughs> One of the bands he had uh, chastising the guys on the bus about their long hair and how they're trying to look like their mothers. <laughs> 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 John Biner is my guest who uh, has appeared in, in uh, I don't know how many years your career has been. I don't want to talk about your age, but decades oh, worth. why not? Okay, you know, how I mean, old are you? You're, you're in your 80s now, right? 84. Good for you. you 28th of this year, 84 years old and feeling like I'm 36. Yes, well, you sound great. Yeah, well, I am. And hey. You and just, hey, how you doing? That was all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to redo this interview again from the beginning because neither of us remember anything about it, but other than that, it went well. Speaking with John Biner, he is uh, my guest today. He, along with his colleague, uh, has offered, authored a book a year ago. It's called Five Minutes, Mr. Biner, A Lifetime of a Laughter. Douglas Wellman is his name. I'm going to toss some of the names out of the people you've worked with over the years. Just give me some stories and, and your thoughts. Steve Allen, as I mentioned at the outset, the man who really was responsible for the beginning of The Tonight Show. 
Oh, the yeah, he was the beginning of the Tonight Show, but I I didn't I didn't want to correct you. I I wasn't I was too young for the beginning of the Tonight Show. Later on, I was I was working uh, after after I, I I got into the business in in Manhattan. I was working with uh, Gary Moore, and I got a call to work with Mel Torme, opening uh, for Mel Torme and uh, Sai Zentner. I mean uh, Woody Herman. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in that in that thing, um, uh, I, I I had my dressing room downstairs, and Mel gave me a call one day, and, and he said, uh, <clears throat> "Steve Allen is up here." And I mean, yeah, he was in the audience. I got ahead of myself. I heard him cackle, and I and I knew that was Steve Allen's cackle out there. <laughs> I was a big fan of his. You know, it's like a <laughs> and one high thing like that. <laughs> and uh, and I said, "Oh my god!" In my act, I'm thinking, "Oh my god, Steve Allen's out there." And anyway, I go downstairs and I'm, I'm getting ready for the next show or whatever I was doing. The phone rings. It's Mel calling me from his dressing room upstairs. Somebody wants to see me. So I go up there. <clears throat> it's Steve Allen. I love your thing. I like what you did. Blah, blah, blah. He said, and when I have my next show, he's got his pen and pencil out. <laughs> There's a very tiny dressing room. He said, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, he was standing, leaning against the, the uh, dressing room table, you know, the bench, whatever the hell they call it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he said, next time I get a show, you're on it. And he just wrote my name and my telephone number, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you hear a lot about that when you're a kid growing up, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I have, yeah, sure, right, you know. And mm-hmm. anyway, I thought it was nice of him to say that, you know, whether he would or not. But but Mel asked me to come out and work with him out in Vegas because he was going to work the Blue Room of the Tropicana. And at the same time, I was going to fly to do the new Ed Sel- a new uh, Steve Allen show, and uh, that's how I got on the Steve Allen show. And that was back in the early, early or the late 80s, uh, 60s, the late 60s, 67, 68. You had a great relationship with both he and his wife. Very much so. In fact, uh, Annie, when I, we uh, moved out here to Florida, um, they invited us to stay with them several times uh, on our trips back to uh, L.A. for work or Annie has a. Uh, a dance thing she does once a year to raise money for kids uh, called the share organization. And they rehearse for six weeks and do one show and raise a mill and a half generally. Hmm. Now let's talk about the guy who most people are familiar with when you, when you say the words of tonight show, and that of course is Johnny Carson. And, yeah. and, and you say in, in your book that appearing uh, uh, in terms of prestige, appearing on the tonight show was the equivalent of appearing on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was an exciting thing for people at night, and the Ed Sullivan show naturally was exciting for people on Sundays. We all sit around the mm-hmm. one television set and and watch uh, the, the wonderful acts that he'd have on the show and the comedians and uh, plate spinners and what have you. You know, he had them all. If you had, if it was out there doing something, he'd have them on the show, and. Um, it was uh, the Tonight Show was the big thing, and, and and as I say, the working it was it was a good thing for comics because if they got on the Ed Sullivan Show and the Tonight Show and they were working a nightclub, there's usually a dinner show where they the the people that that were there to see the uh, you know the early show mm-hmm. were uh, people that watched the Sullivan Show and the people that come in to see the Ed Sullivan Show or rather the Late Show. Was uh, were the people that watched the Johnny Carson show? Yeah, it makes sense. And it's yeah. interesting that you you and Johnny Carson share a share uh, a common trait, which many people oh, might yeah. find surprising, which is the fact that you alluded to briefly is the fact that both of you are extremely shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I uh, I uh, I get to know people, and they can't get me to shut up. You know, but <laughs> but before you get to know somebody, you know, you don't know what the, how they think if they're going to take this as a joke or how you know you know you have you have to get to know somebody, you have to bond with them in some sure. some way. So uh, Carson is uh, is a guy who just can never got to really get close to anybody. I think, mm-hmm. and he was uh, just uh, his own man, and he knew what he wanted and. And at the same time, he never had much conversation. And uh, and uh, and when you'd be away for six, eight, ten months, whatever it was, till you, uh, since you'd done the last show, and uh, he'd come down to the, the uh, makeup room to have his hands done or something, and and he'd always uh, start a conversation by doing the uh, the George Jessel impersonation <laughs> as he, best he could. Rather than saying, "Oh, hi, John, how you?" <laughs> yeah. And uh, and that would be it. 
That would be it. <clears throat> tell me about Carol Burnett and your time spent with her. Well, I tell you, <clears throat> Carol Burnett, <clears throat> pardon me, is like <clears throat> having a heck of a sister. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, she's just good. For, I mean, she'll do it. <laughs> she, she's just great. She's just fantastic. She comes into the room. There's no fuss, no big deal. Who? Oh, here comes. It's just, hey, Carol, you know, she's right there and she's, She's one of us. She's, she's, you know, she's just, she's that comfortable to be around. It's just, uh, is, is a better way, I guess you'd say, but she is. She's, uh, she's Carol Burnett. And, and talk about a selfless performer. Like, she is, as funny as she was, she had no problem standing back and letting uh, Har- the Harvey Corman and Tim Conway just take over the show for the next 20 minutes. It's always good. It's always good. And this Steve Allen was the same way. He he let sit sit back and <clears throat> let people do their thing and get a laugh and, and laugh them himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to be. And and they, they you know, they they have a better life because they're having a good time. Ted Wallachin returns in a moment. Hey, it's Ted Wallachin for Tom's Place. You know, our fall merchandise is starting to arrive, but we still have massive amounts of summer clothing that needs to be cleared. Blowout sale prices on virtually everything, like cone suits, regularly six fifty, now three ninety nine each, or three for a thousand dollars. Plus, beautiful sports jackets and designer dress pants, fifty percent off. Check out our deals throughout the store with huge savings off our already below retail prices. If you need a suit for an upcoming special event, we are Toronto's one-stop suit shop. With the finest outfit for every occasion, there is no better time to find the perfect addition to your wardrobe. Everything is on sale to make way for our fall merchandise. Tom's Place is open weekdays from 11 to 6, 10 to 5 Saturday, 12 to 5 Sunday. Visit Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachan. John Biner is my guest today. The first time you and I spoke to you, you talked about... uh, your relationship with Elvis, and not the closest of friends, but you had you did have a relationship. Oh no, yeah, we ran into each other, and yeah. At first, it was uh, I. I heard my name, and I looked down, and they, it was at the the Hilton Hotel. Uh, a friend of mine and I were walking in, and and she wanted to play the the slot machines and and the uh, the uh, uh, gambling, the the big stuff, you know, the crap games and all that were down. And like a like a large pit, you'd say a step down, like a step down living room. Right. And we were up on a higher level, and um, and I heard Biner, and I just like turned and looked, and there was Elvis with the guys around him, and and he says, "Hey, Joan," like that. <laughs> I, said, I said, "Hey, hi, Elvis." I said, "How you doing?" He says, "Going down the tubes," <laughs> 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 and that that was it. And uh, and a few minutes after that, my, my friend and I are playing the slots, and and uh, and his little guy that used to be his like yes man running around his comic, you know his I don't know what you call it his jester his court jester mm-hmm. came by and said oh the guys you know Elvis likes to laugh and he liked that I said that's nice I'm happy to hear that <laughs> and, uh, yes. and uh and I let I let it go at that and I found out later on that that kid. Uh, when he was fired, he lifted the one of Elvis's favorite rings, and uh, Elvis had to Elvis had to go to the airport and, and go out and stop the plane. You no, know, no, I would, I would, I would imagine he'd be a fairly uh, uh, intimidating guy to first meet, Elvis. Uh yeah. Well, it was it was kind of interesting because everything was like one of those quick bye, hi, 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 with Elvis, and then and then once uh, <laughs> I was working with Glenn Campbell. And, uh, who was good friends with you? Very good friend. Yeah, yeah. He used to come. My, <laughs> he used to come to my house when he'd have a fight with his girlfriend, <laughs> and stay on the couch. Well, that's and, that's uh, a sign of a good friend, right there. That's a, that's a good friend. Uh, yeah. So Elvis, Elvis. It was always a you know a thing, a little thing, little thing like that. And then working with Elvis, and uh, and I had uh, I had done my thing, and it was it was my daughter Sandy's tenth uh, birthday. And uh, I had the rest of the gang going on down with me, and uh, there were three of them at the time with me, and uh, El- and and she got to uh, she got to uh, get down. We, we, we were I did my act, 
And uh, generally, I'd, I'd, I'd go and do something else in the casino or go to grab a bite to eat or something. But this night, I was with the kids. We were allowed to go up into the balcony and watch uh, Glenn Campbell. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we didn't know that Elvis was there. Well, and, uh, El- and, and Glenn introduces him. Elvis right down here, you know, and, and, uh, and we looked down and we could see he was right below us in the booth with his guys, right? Three or four of the guys and Elvis. And uh, we go and watch in the show. Everybody gives him a big hand. I say, we go back to watching the show. And, uh, and I look over and, and, and Sandy, <laughs> Sandy's not in her seat. And I said, where the heck, where's Sandy? And my son said, she's done. It says, she's, she's down there. And I looked down and she's standing there talking to Elvis. And next thing I know, she's in Elvis's lap in the booth, 10 years old. Man. And, 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 uh, and her wedding, uh, I mean, not her wedding, but her birthday uh, suit. <laughs> not, mm-hmm. not a birthday suit, but, yeah. but her birthday dress. Okay. So, uh, so I, I go, oh my God, said, wow. She said with Elvis, she, she, was, she was never a shy kid. But, uh, but I, I go, I go uh, back to get her after bringing the kids upstairs, the other ones. And uh, she had gone to, with, with Elvis to, to Glenn's dressing room after the show. And so I went back to get her. And, uh, and in so doing, I run into Elvis as I'm opening this door. Yeah. And he's got his guys with him and i say hey hi elvis and he doesn't answer me you know so we're just like a foot and a half away from each other and i and i reach down and i grab his hand at the side his side and lift it up <laughs> his right hand and i shake his hand and it's clammy and you know it's like soft and nothing's going on yeah. so i drop his hand and and the, and the guys are looking at me with these strange faces you know these look like like they're looking mad like we were ready to and I go, whoa, gee whiz, wow, you know. And he walks by me, the guys, and they push by me. And I go, I start up to the door again, and I hear, hey, Joan. And I turn, and, and he says, I met your daughter. She's real nice. <laughs> and the guys start laughing. It was all a put on, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. So that's, that was that. And, uh, and then I worked with Bobby Gentry. And, uh, and, and Elvis came to see the show, and I... Uh, uh, I, 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 I was down in my dressing room. I heard, I heard uh, a friend of mine, I let him sit in my dressing room and uh, the drummer in the Bobby show. And uh, he would tell me after I'd take a ride out in the, in the, uh, in the fresh air, I'd go out the mountains between shows and roll the windows down the car and get some fresh air because they were allowed to smoke in those days in the, in the rooms. And yeah. it got to me after a while. And, uh, and I'd come back and I'd say, hey, what's going on? He said, Elvis stopped by to see you. And I said, yeah, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, one night I'm sitting around with him in the dressing room. It was raining out or something. And the phone rings and it's Bobby from her dressing room upstairs. Somebody wants to see you. I go up, I knock on the dressing room door and Elvis opens it. <laughs> <clears throat> and he says, sorry about the hat. He's got this cowboy on, black cowboy, black outfit. And he says, sorry about the hat. I'm having a bad hair day. (laughs) (laughs) Those those are words that you'd never expect out of Elvis's mouth. (laughs) I'm having a bad hair day. (laughs) Bad hair day. So so, uh, we uh, were all sitting around BSing, and he he gets up, and he's called into the uh, where where Bobby is. And he goes back out, and and I hear, feel his shoulder, hands on my shoulders and back. And he said, hey, John, come on over to Hilton game, bring a couple of friends. Well, that was fun. So we went over there and had a great time at his Hilton Hotel suite. It was beautiful. Great stuff. John Biner is my guest. Uh, there's so much in, in your career that you've, that you've done, and we could spend hours and hours. But, but, but I do want to talk about uh, your, your time spent with, with the great Alan Bly and Bob Einstein. We started back in, I guess, about the early 80s. Pay TV, were, pay TV was just coming into being, and they came to you with an idea. Yeah, he said we had this crazy idea. They had me up. I had met them uh, on uh, Sonny and Cher show and a few other places, but you know, not enough to sit down and talk business or anything. And and I, I went in there and into their office in the Valley in L.A. and uh, <clears throat> and they said they had this idea to do this kind of wacky show and uh, they were going to call it bizarre and it's going to be a little bit 
uh, you know, risque and a little bit more than the Benny Hill show and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I being a ham figured, wow, I can do all these characters and stuff. Of course. And, uh, and, uh, it, I went up, we, we did a few shots around, uh, LA and then, uh, we all went up to, uh, your beautiful country to Toronto CFTO. And, uh, we did uh, the bizarre show for five years in a row. And, and bizarre was, and people don't realize it. There were actually two versions. The version, I guess, that we saw was on CTV, which is the main network, which is the cleaned yeah. up version. Yeah. But the one that Showtime showed showed a lot more. Well, that was that was the whole idea. You know, Showtime wanted something a little a little different. That uh, you know, be saying because it was uh, cable, and there weren't going to be any people saying, "Yo, you can't say that, and you can't do that, and you can't do this." And uh, we got to we got to do all kinds of crazy things like the bigot family and uh, mm -hmm. and 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 as as you're leading to the uh, the girls without bras on and this that and the other thing you know and and um, you know, <laughs> it was all in the script and they're making me out to be a pervert you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> but you know I I got a little flack from that show from people that wanted a real clean act and a live act and I had to explain them to, I, I it was all it was all for cable television what can I tell you and, and we had the we had the opportunity to do, to use the, the f word for example lots of times but I think in the five years we did it, in the 125 or 30 shows we did, it was just two times, and they were in perfect places. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, 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 I mentioned and, that uh, the Bizarre, Bizarre was, was, was produced by um, a Canadian, Alan Bly, and also yes. Bob Einstein. Now, Bob Einstein, of course, went on to become S Super Dave Osborne. So many things, yeah. Yeah, Bob and what a great, what a great talent. And, so, and unfortunately, friend, yeah. un until he died, he was, I guess he was a regular on Arrested Development. We were we were tight tight buddies for a long time after that, enduring, and and, uh, and and then for years after the show, I mean, we went off in eighty five, eighty six, years after the show, up to like just a few months before he passed on. Every month or two, the phone would ring, and and I hear this very familiar voice start just start a joke without saying it's me or what how are you or anything. It would be like. <laughs> Uh, bring, bring, I pick up the phone. Two guys walk into a bar, you know. <laughs> he had that, he had that voice. He sounded like he'd been drinking. That, you know, I wouldn't have to ask who it was naturally, but uh, you we, know, we had because he had that voice. It sounded like he'd been drinking for like voice, yes, <laughs> distinct voice. Yeah, and when he get close to the end of a joke, this always got me. <laughs> I'd wait for the even if I hadn't, if I had heard a joke, I wouldn't interrupt him. I'd just wait, and I knew when the end was coming because his voice would change. Because he get excited that he's going to tell you the punchline, <laughs> and it would be like this. <laughs> so they come walking out, and he's got the shovel in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, he oh, is a good guy. Yeah, good guy. Bob There's... Einstein was was the brother of of Albert Brooks, the great comedian, actor, uh, film yeah. film director. Yeah. Yeah. So, which means Albert Brooks' real name is actually Albert Einstein. In a sense, and, and who would, who would name their kid Albert Einstein is the question I have in my mind. <laughs> maybe, maybe Albert Einstein. You know, you talk in 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 your book, uh, John, about a, a lot of the beginnings of your career before we before you we were professional. Back when you were just a young kid, you auditioned at talent shows all over the place. I mean, there were talent shows well, yeah, left, right, and center. Was happening around the town, the church talent show. It's you know. Uh, a talent show in in the, the little town next to us, or something. Any place I could take a bus or walk to, I would uh, I'd uh, I'd throw the jacket on and go and and do it. And and the thing is, uh, there'd be you know the guy who play guitar, a little girl that danced, the blah 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 blah, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, to raise funds for the church or whatever. But but every time every time they were going to say, and now we're going to bring out the one the win, <laughs> tell you who the winner is. And, and all the people backstage would say, oh, John, yeah, you're going to win. You're going to win. They didn't even know me, only to know that I did my thing. You're going to win. The guy that did the voices, you're going to win. You're going to win. It's the, it, the winner is Grace Kevin. You know? <laughs> Grace Kevin's the 60-year-old six-year-old daughter of the banker who has patent leather shoes 
and did a dance to some. So you're you're in to put it into Olympic parlance. You're the the proverbial silver medal winner. That was this was. <laughs> <laughs> no, if there was anything on the bronze. <laughs> it, okay. It was, you know, you go home a little bit. Then I got the feeling, oh, the whole thing is a fix anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. When I do it, it's just all, you know, it's all set up. They know who they're going to pick anyway and what the hell is the difference. Which is what a lot of people think about a lot of talent shows that are on television today. But that's... The whole ta- oh, that's all you have now. I know. <laughs> it's, that's all you have is talent shows. Amazing. And you know what? It's very inexpensive to do because they're not paying anybody any money yeah they're just you know and the sets are all the same and all that kind of stuff well but, you know it's, uh, a, it's a totally different landscape today because back when when you john biner first began there were no comedies uh, comedy clubs and now there's like there's oh, ten, yeah. there's 10 in every city there's there's it's, 150 different t- talent shows on television there's all kinds of opportunities for people to to get oh, their yeah. chops and back yeah, when you were around there wasn't stuff yeah show your stuff you know but back when you were there, that was that was like it was almost like you had to build your own stage to perform. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? <laughs> Great stuff for anybody who's just beginning in the entertainment industry or anybody who's in it. Uh, this is a must read. It's a must yeah. read for for anybody who in, enjoys terrific stories, and there are many of them. The book yeah. is the book is called Five Minutes, Mister Biner: A Lifetime of Laughter. It is a uh, Co-written um, by Douglas Wellman, and the author is my guest, John Binder. A real pleasure, John. I thank you very much for taking the time. And, and again, I really enjoyed the read. All the best to you. Well, thank you very much, Ted. And it's a pleasure talking to you. And if you need me again for anything, let me know. I will do that. In the meantime, we'll say hi to your to your friend, uh, Gary Chowan, who is a stylist on uh, on Super Dave and Bazaar for years, or I, yes. as, as we like to call him here, Canada's Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> He's the best and a terrific friend. He is indeed. All the best to you, sir. Yeah. Take care. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.